Okay, thank you everybody for being here today. So I'm going to present you one of the projects we did in the course of our activities at Visium. So, but before diving into the project, I'm going to explain you what I mean a bit by course of activities and what we do at Visium to, to set a bit the context. So as it says here, uh, we are a company developing tailored and customized solutions in artificial intelligence and machine learning for the biggest society, biggest companies around the world. And we set ourselves the mission to democratize the access to AI for the good of society and businesses. Uh, and we created the company and we set ourselves this mission following the observation that the, the gap, the ever-growing gap between the big tech companies and, and the rest of the industry that is struggling a bit to capture these kind of opportunities. So our team at Visium uh, is composed of engineers from ETH, GPFL. We are based at the Innovation Park next door and also near uh, the ETH in Zurich, so we have two offices. Uh, we are mostly made of engineers with very diverse background, uh, with common denominators that we like data, we like analytics, and we all apply machine learning to our specific industry, let's say, whether it is financial industry or neuroscience or mathematics. Okay, so diving into the project, uh, so to give you a bit of context, this is a project we developed for Nestlé, it was an experimental project we did, uh, and the idea initially came from their intrapreneurship program they have internally, which is called Ingenious. Uh, so it was initially an idea from, from their employee in, in the field. And the, 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 the name, uh, the nickname of the, of the project is called Listen to Machine, and you will quickly understand why. So, as any, any project, uh, let me start by the problem. So why, why they had this idea on the field, let's say. Uh, so how it's right now in most of Nestle factory and, and manufacturing chain, you have John whose job is to control uh, the, smooth, the smoothness of the manufacturing chain to be sure there is no interruption or any machine breakdown and this kind of things. So he's in his control room and every couple of hours the machines, depending on the actions they are doing, what they are, because not all the machines are doing the same thing in a manufacturing chain obviously, uh, they can be subject to different kind of problems and anomalies. Uh, we focused on four of them here. So the first one is the steam safety valves that is opening up because the machine is experiencing too much pressure. Then also trying to detect when the tank of the machine is getting empty of raw material. So the pump is spinning up to keep up with the flow when actually the, the raw material, the tank is empty. Then you have all the kind of alarms that can happen and other kind of anomalies. So each of them happen every every hour for every machine. So what you, typically happen is that John has to leave his daily or like activity he's doing, the task he's performing, to go check regularly if a machine has broken down or is stopped for whatever reason. And they, he doesn't have really, sometimes he comes, there is nothing wrong, he just wasted his time and he has to get back to the task and focus again. So it's a very inefficient process. So the idea uh, to, this, to, to solve this issue that came from, from John, one of the operators on site, is to be able to listen to the machines because all of the alarms he's dealing with can be heard, like, like as, as if you are in your car and you're trying to, you, you hear something wrong, you need to go to the garage, exactly the same thing. So his idea was to listen to the machine and as long as there is something detected by the machine learning model or the artificial intelligence that is abnormal, to notify him on his dashboard so he can see in real time the health status of the machine over time, basically. So he only goes to the machine to repair them when it's actually needed. So the benefits are pretty, probably quite clear. I'm gonna go quickly over it. So lower maintenance and replacement costs because if you have the pump spinning up for 30 minutes, the life expectancy of your machine is obviously decreasing. You also experience less uh, machine downtimes and shorter failure, uh, like failure response time. So you shorten the delay to, to, to react, basically. So the solution we designed at Visium uh, to tackle this challenge is in four steps. The first one is the data recording and labeling, so taking care of all of this. AI models and algorithms, the communication systems, which can be seen as the, the glue that is uh, like making everything work together smoothly. And then you have the real-time dashboard and notifications to notify John when there is something wrong going on. So diving straight into the first one. Um, for the data recording and labeling, uh, we opted for a very simple Raspberry Pi 4 uh, for the, the embedded devices. They are very simple yet super powerful. 
uh, Ray Speaker Array V2, which are quite cheap, um, like microphones, because the goal is to de deploy this at large scales. And this is the kind of microphone you find in Google Home or Alexa, for example, to give an idea of the, the, the grade of the mic. Then it's all based on Raspbian OS. And you can see on the right hand side the, 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 the very handy web interface we developed for the operator and for our own team to be able to label the different alarms. So saying when there is something starting and when it stops. Uh, at the beginning we tried to label by ourselves purely, but it was very difficult with the, without the domain expertise and domain knowledge from, from the operator. So that's why we opted for a dashboard to label the sound. And at the end, our engineers will be given a few hundreds of these samples where you have the sound signals in red and you have the anomalies when they started in pink, for example, you have the, the pump and when it's soft and for each of the type of alarm. Now, getting to the juicy part, uh, the AI models and algorithms. So we decided to split the objective in two. So we wanted to, be, to detect the anomalies as best as possible and then be able to classify them if possible. But the, the, really the minimal requirement was to detect the anomalies as fast as possible since they happen quite often, we couldn't be like 10 minutes late. So we split it in two and I'm going to start by the algorithm for the detection part. So the first step, as any project in data science and machine learning, uh, we decided to, we did some standard feature extraction that you can find in a typical sun processing project. So we computed the male spectrogram coefficient, their first order difference, so the derivative, and the sound energy of the time frame. So we are left with this kind of things. Uh, so over the, the coefficients over a window of three and a half seconds in this case. And then you have the same thing for the first order difference and the energy over, over the time frame. So as you can see, there is a time dependency here. So for the, the modeling part, we opted for a recurrent neural network kind of architecture, uh, more specifically GRU cells. Uh, so which are able to process the frames while leveraging the temporal structure of the data, let's say. And then within each of these cells, so the A, A prime and so on, we have an autoencoder. So briefly, briefly, but simply put, um, the goal of the autoencoder is to take the sound frame at every time step to, and to be able to reconstruct it back. And the logic behind this is that we want to, to learn how to reconstruct a normal signal so then the difference between the input and the output is going to be huge when we have an anomaly because the model has not been trained to reconstruct abnormal sounds. So that's the whole hypothesis behind this. So at the end of the day we have this delta in the schema above and the delta is simply the difference between the output and the input and it gives us what we call the reconstruction error. So now two things left. Uh, if we only use the, the reconstruction error as it is like this, it's very unstable. Even, even with normal sound patterns, it's very, very shaky. So what we did is very simple yet quite effective technique. We use some sliding window that you can see on the left hand side uh, with a given stride and we averaged out over the same frame, which allowed us to get at the end of the day this green signal you see at the bottom, which was much, much more smooth, let's say. So that's for the post-processing. And now the, we have to define a threshold. So above what value, above which value do we say that the reconstruction loss is high enough to notify John in his control room? So to, to define automatically the threshold dynamically, what we did is a kind of a very simple online algorithms. We store the last n reconstruction errors, we compute the median of those, and we take a coefficient of these. So in our, in our case, it was between one and three, uh, depending on the sound environment, let's say. So, so typically it was two times the median was our threshold. So as soon as the probability or the reconstruction error in green surpass this threshold theta, we raise a notification on the dashboard and we pass the anomaly frame to the classification model. So for the anomaly, detection, uh, anomaly classification pipeline, the first step is, is exactly similar to the other one. We actually take the frame for the, from the first pipeline, so nothing new under the sun. Uh, the, the only difference is now, like we already have a detection model which is quite complex and slow. So here we cannot afford to use a deep learning architecture like an RNN. So we have to thought about something different uh, that is not able to leverage the time dimension but still can process this. So what we did is that we took the mean and the standard deviation over the time dimension and we are left basically with a vector like this. So we take the mean for each coefficient, the standard deviation over the each coefficient. So what happens at the end of the day is that we are squashing over the, the time dimension basically. So we are able to process our input with much simpler models and less complex than an RNN. 
In our case, we considered mainly five types and, and classes of, of, of models uh, supervised, so approximate nearest neighbors, uh, logistic regression, random forest, SVM, and fully connected networks. We also tried combinations of those uh, using ensembling techniques like majority voting and so on. But having to balance out the, the our our use case has to run in real time. Uh, most of the ensembling technique were very robust, much more powerful, but also very very slow. So at the end of the day, we used the bare and raw SVM, which had the right balance between inference speed and the, the accuracy, the, the detection rate, basically. So. A very simple uh, schema for the communication systems and how it works in, in, in practice. So basically we have our microphone network, uh, like for example two or three per manufacturing line. Uh, you can imagine many of them in, in a whole plant or factory. Uh, they are streaming in real time the sound to a database uh, to store the sound uh, on, on, on some other server like an, an, a NAS and some, or something. You have the labeling dashboard connected to the database that can pull the sound and then label it and, and save it back to the database to be able to do live labeling for the operator. At the same time, we are also streaming the sound to the detection and classification pipelines uh, in, in real time. Uh, and basically, once we have a detection, usually we, we get the notification and we can intervene in less than like roughly half a second, basically. So the delay, the whole thing, the whole detection, classification, and, and reporting uh, on the dashboard takes half a second. So we are near real time, basically. And last piece, uh, quite interesting too, uh, the retraining script. So basically we have a kind of a job running from time to time, like once a week or something, that is pulling the labeled sound from the database uh, retraining the model and hot swapping the model uh, live uh, for, for the detection and classification if the new model is better trained on the new data that has been labeled by the, by the operator. So very broadly put, um, the, the technologies we use for this are sockets, REST API, cron jobs, and MySQL for the database. If you want more information, don't hesitate to, 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 to get in touch. Last but not least, uh, the notification dashboard. So basically the goal here was to make something as friendly as possible for non-tech savvy people. So it's broken down in three components. You have the live detector on top, uh, where the blue curve is the reconstruction error basically. So you can see here that we are, at this at the time of the screenshot, we are experiencing an anomaly because it's way above the threshold you see in, in red, uh, which is again beta times the median. Uh, so that's the, 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 the line you see here in red. And once something is detected, so it's above the line, it's logged in the past anomalies, so right below. Uh, and basically, you have all, we are grouping the anomalies together if they occur, if they occur uh, in the same time frame, basically. Because otherwise, in such a setting here, you will be spammed with past anomalies. So what you can do then, you can click on the details of the group, and you can see all the anomalies that have been logged for this group, basically. And you can see the probabilities for each of them uh, given by the SVM. Uh, and then the operator can freely like, say that the, the label is correct or relabel the data live and, and plug it back to the database for retraining later. So he can correct the classification when he has a, a couple of minutes to spend. And lastly, we have some anomaly statistics. Not all of them are on the screenshot here, but the goal is to give some a, a, a meta view on the manufacturing line. So basically saying, okay, half of your breakdowns or anomalies have come from this, uh, average response time is this, and so on and so forth. So that's basically the anomaly statistics. And to create all of this, uh, we built, uh, based on Node.js, React.js, and Semantic UI for the, the UI UX for, for John. So the learning experience, uh, to conclude, and the different ambushes we, we stumbled upon, uh, with the team. So first you have everything related to when you do computing on embedded devices. So you have to, to take, take into account the computational power of the device. Here a Raspberry Pi 4. Uh, the storage, uh, do you store the sound, where do you store the sound, how, and then you have the power supply and the connectivity. So because when, maybe in, your, in our office we have uh, like Wi-Fi or fiber optics and in, in limited power supply, but when you are in a manufacturing chain in Brazil it's probably not the case. So you have to take all of this into account. Then the speed, uh, as I said before, model complexity, the trade-off between this and the robustness of the model also. Uh, also, the recurrent neural networks, uh, at the beginning we started using bi-directional uh, neural networks, so using past and future information basically to detect anomalies, but when you are in an online setting, 
uh, it doesn't really make sense to go for like to use future information. So we have to change this back. And it's, we are at the end of the day using unidirectional uh, RNN. The average over the windows I talked about, it induces, um, let's say, incompressible delay on, on the inference because you have to wait the number of windows you want to compute the average. So the half second delay we have is most mostly comes from this average trick we used actually. And the multi-threading, so being able to recall the sound, store the sound, do the processing and ra raise a notification on the dashboard, so the reporting, doing all of this at the same time. Uh, with, and in a robust in a robust manner, so it doesn't crash uh, after one hour in production. It's kind of tricky, and it added a lot of uh, software engineering complexity. Then, uh, regarding the sound and the sound processing in particular, so having access to human labels, uh, as it has been said before uh, by my fellow speaker, uh, having good labels was very, very beneficial for the application. So having access to the operator to tell us, okay, here you can hear the alarm, it's very, it's very small, but you can hear it start, you can hear the pressure like increasing and so on, and our engineers were not able to identify these kind of things. Then the 3D printed boxes also uh, played some tricks on us uh, because we did most of the experiments even on site in the manufacturing without the, the case, the casing let's say. And the problem was that at the end of the day, when we did the, the first test putting in, in, in a safe box, a 3D printed box, the sound was so different that it totally changed uh, and, and the model was not so good in production so we had to redo a bit uh, our, our things. It relates to the third point, environmental overfitting. When you do this kind of project, it's very easy to think you're safe because you have a training set, you have a testing set and so on. But at the end of the day, you still have common, common information between the two, which are the recording conditions. So it's very easy to overfit the recording conditions and thinking you're fine because you take one day for training, one day for testing, but at the end of the day, you are at the same place, same white noise in the background and so on. So changing the, the conditions uh, is very, very important. And the pre-processing influence, we saw a lot of influence by changing the pre-processing, the, the coefficients, as I told before, and so on. All of this has a huge influence on this kind of sound processing applications at, at the end of the day. Thank you very much for your attention, and I will be happy to take on any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Timon. You have one question, please?